Uh, this is my dream come true, but it's one of them. I've been trying for five years to get Sir Philip back to Jericho in this wonderful set in the Basilica, the Church of St. Barnabas. You've got some information on it in front of you. He, he's here to talk about his and Lyra's Jericho. Later, Mark Davis, the local Jericho history guru, and I will lob him some very gentle questions. Then a very few questions from you. Uh, you're here to hear Sir Philip also to launch our book, Ten Oxford Authors, which is on your seats, ten literary walks, with all good stuff from five different authors. Meanwhile, let the very community-minded vicar, Father Christopher Woods, introduce Sir Philip. On dogmatic religious zeal, Sir Philip has been less touching or romantic than he was about Jericho, but then I think that is pretty fair. Archbishop Rowan Williams admires Sir Philip for that. So I think it's only right and fitting that Sir Philip, we welcome you today to Jericho to speak to us in the Basilica, which you say has Romanesque splendor. It was built to bring hope and vitality to the people of this neighborhood. Sir Philip, welcome. When I was a student here, when I was an undergraduate, um, in 1965 to 68, I spent quite a lot of time wandering about the city. Uh, I had come from a little local comprehensive school in North Wales, never been to Oxford before, never been anywhere like this before, and it was architecturally kind of overwhelming. Uh, it was, as I say, the mid-late 60s, and there were a lot of temptations to keep one away from one's work. And um, I think I succumbed to many of them. But one of the things I did find so unusual and strange about the city was not only that it was, it was so rich architecturally, the, the college architectures, the chapels, the spires, the, um, the, uh, the Radcliffe camera, of course, the great university buildings, um, but it was also the city full of odd little corners. You'd go down a, 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 a street that was perfectly normal and maybe even quite modern. And there would be an open door that you hadn't noticed before. And beyond the door, a perfect, beautiful garden. No hint of it on the outside, but there it was, hidden away. And um, the place I did enjoy most, I didn't really make the acquaintance of Jericho until much later, but... I did enjoy very much uh, walking through St. Ebbs um, before the planners got hold of it. And I used to think afterwards that Joni Mitchell knew about St. Ebbs and when she sang about them paving paradise and putting up a parking lot, that was exactly what she meant because that was pretty well what happened. Uh, again, a mixture of old and new, the, the, the jam factory that we've just heard about, the... Um, other kinds, of, other kinds of building, pubs, um, shops, um, a lot of dwelling houses, a gas works, all sorts of strange things jumbled together, as you can still see on an old map of Oxford. Um, and Jericho, which I didn't come to know till later, is very much that sort of thing, but has been spared the worst of what the planners could do, I'm very glad to say. The, of course, it has the, the, the great wide open space of... Um, Port Meadow, just behind it. What an asset that is. What a great, wide, green, free, open space. The lungs of the city. And th between, between Jericho and um, Port Meadow, of course, there's the canal. Um, Oxford is laced through and through with water. The canal, the rivers, the mill streams, um, and all sorts of stories about them as well. That was a story I was reading just recently about, I think it was the Trill Mill stream, um, where they discovered in the 1920s a punt containing two skeletons. 
uh, a man and a woman in Victorian dress. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a very good story, isn't it? And I should probably steal it and use it one day. Um, Jericho, I, I, I found when I began to get to know it, is really uh, less like a part of Oxford and more like a little, little town all on its own, centred on, well, clustered around the edge of the canal. And the canal is full of, used to be, very busy with boats coming and going, um, usually get down to the, um, the wharves at the bottom uh, behind St. Peter's, down that, that way, bringing coal, bringing um, ceramics, bringing all sorts of things. And then going, along, going back along the great network of canals that leads right into the heart of England and up towards the north. Um, England, Britain is laced through with water, but Oxford more than most. And that is uh, what I sometimes um, imagine is, is, is what makes it a more interesting place than Cambridge. Um, <laughs> Oh, there's water in Cambridge as well, but it's sort of flat, isn't it, you know? And, uh, there's more of it in Oxford. And certainly the, um, the river mists that come up I I I at night, because Oxford is in a sort of big dip like this, big saucer with the hills on one side and hills on the other, and the mists gather out of the water and, the, and, they, and they somehow seep through the city and make it a, a, a good place for telling stories. Um, Oxford is a, is, is a, is a great, has a great literary history, of course. Um, I sometimes think Oxford for literature and politics and Cambridge for mathematics and treachery. <laughs> the, the, there wasn't an Oxford Five that betrayed MI5 and so on. Somebody pointed out that that's because they, they were clever enough not to get caught, unlike the Cambridge ones. <laughs> well, we shall never know unless, unless someone tells a story. Well, that might be another story for me. But Jericho itself ha has been very good to me because it, uh, when I needed somewhere for my Lyra to, as it were, run wild, this um, child with a strange history, born who knows where, her parents both dead, apparently, uh, brought up in the strange and might be forbidding, but in fact welcoming, um, uh, Oxford College, Jordan College, as I called my college, Exeter College. Um, she couldn't spend all her time studying and reading and doing what she was told and being a good girl. She had to run wild occasionally. And this is the ideal place to do that. I don't know what um, the children of St. Barnabas School get up to. My own son, the younger son, went there for a while. Um, so I know what a good school it is. Uh, but Lyra found in the companionship of the, um, the children of Jericho and Roundabout and of the people I called the Egyptians, the boat dwellers, the water people, um, a kind of freedom and excitement and vividness of life that uh, for all the, all the scholarship and all the history and so on, she couldn't find in her in her home, her college, Jordan College. So it represented for her, and for me as I came to write about it, that sense of freedom and a, a, a slight naughtiness as well. Um, a slight sense of mischief. A slight sense of what people get up to when the police aren't around. A slight sense of, um, well, not so much rule breaking as rule ignoring. Uh, it, it was a an enjoyable place to be anyway for Lyra and for me as I thought about it. And then as, uh, as um, the, the books about her in the first trilogy were published um, little by little, um, things changed of course in Oxford and in Jericho. Um, there were threats to the life along the canal. There were um, developments, that awful word develop, which that could have a quite a promising sound to it, but somehow we've come to dread the developers and developments. Um, seem to be threatening the boatyard on the canal and the way of life of people who live near the canal and the, um, even, even the, 
the ease with which you could get on a boat and go up and down. So I became involved in that um, at the invitation of some people who were themselves boat dwellers. And I got to know them and, and visit the boat yard and see the sorts of things that, that were done. And I realised what a rich network of activities and lives and connections there were between the water and the land, between the boats and the houses, between the, um, uh, the people who st stayed in one place and the people who moved about. And I, I, I grew to treasure that very much. And when the, um, when, the thing, when the story is eventually over and when the, the, the developments that must come have come and improved it, as we hope they will, um, I look forward to seeing the, um, the, the Jericho of the future. And I hope that this connection between, as I say, the houses and the boats, the land and the, and the water, um, will, be, will be enriched and will still be there and still be making people's lives, both on the water and on the land, more interesting and more fun and more, more creative too. Um, at one point there was a vision um, that uh, we, were, we were offered of the, where, where the boat yard was, um, a sort of piazza with uh, little workshops for people involved in making boats or involved in making other things, jewellery, um, painting, that sort of thing. I love that idea. And I also remember about this time um, seeing a picture in the, a painting in the Ashmolean Museum. One of um, Canaletto's paintings of Venice, but this wasn't, the main, this wasn't Venice itself, it's a little place further, further inland on the Brenta Canal. And it showed um, a man sitting on a pile of sacks full of grain waiting to be ground in the mill. It showed a boat turning around. It showed a group of people fashionable, fashionably dressed out for, a, out for a walk in the sunshine. It showed a little dog frisking about. It showed somebody leaning over a weir as if he was fishing. It showed all those things and it even had a, a square campanile in the background, rather like the one on this church. And I thought, what an extraordinary thing. There's, there's a picture which is so treasured and so guarded that the Ashmolean Museum proudly puts it on its walls. And just a few hundred yards away, there's this place, this Campanile, this, this, this way of life, this stretch of canal, which is being boarded up and ignored and threatened. Uh, why not put the two things together? Why not just treat the one as we treat the other? by which I mean treat the land, the canal, and the boatyard, and the life of the water and the life of the canal with as much um, care and respect and reverence indeed that um, great works of art are treated in our great museums. Uh, well, I wrote a piece about saying that in the, uh, for The Guardian and of course nobody took any notice. <laughs> but the picture is still there, at least, and the Jericho of the future is there too. I believe firmly in that. I'm sure that when we finally sorted out what's what and who's going to go where and how it's all going to happen, Jericho would one, will once again be a lovely place to visit, a real gem, a real treasure, a part of the great rich Oxford tapestry of buildings and people and the life that goes on between them all. Um, I've come back to Jericho again and again many times, um, um, often to go to the, 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 the Phoenix Cinema, to see whatever they had on there. Um, friends of mine and my wife's um, used, before the lockdown, used to go there every week and see whatever was on and then come away and go to the fish and chip shop and discuss in learned ways what we'd just seen um, or not. Um, well, again, the cinema's still there. It was there when I was an undergraduate and I remember walking out of a film the only, one of the only two times I've ever walked out of a film, a Japanese film I saw when I was oh, 20 or something, it was called Harakiri. And that's exactly what it was about. And I was, I was disgusted and I walked out. Many years later, I also had occasion to walk out of the Phoenix Cinema, but this time because it was a film made with a handheld camera and such jump cutting that I couldn't see, it was making me feel sick. 
So I left the, the only two times I've ever walked out of the cinema, both out of the Phoenix Cinema in, in Wall Street, in Jericho. So it's played um, a vivid part in my life and my education, my education as a reader and a writer. Um, it's been a place I've loved to visit. Friends live here. I currently live outside the city in Cumna, where the climate is a bit different. Uh, we're up on a hill, and the winds are dry, and uh, the, the mists of Oxford don't, don't visit us. But I love to come to Jericho, and I love to visit this part of Oxford, and thank you very much for inviting me here uh, to say a little bit about it. Now, I gather um, there are going to be some questions. Yes, Sir Philip. Would you like to come and sit down here? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, you didn't much like Oxford, did you? I was... Uh, Reading English, because in my simplicity, I thought that if I wanted to write books, uh, it would be a good idea to be educated in the reading of them. But um, I wasn't ready for some of the books we had to read. I don't think you're ready for Middlemarch until you've been married a few years and you're at least 40 years old. To write about it as a callow youth of 18 who knows nothing was a bit of a challenge. Uh, so I spent quite a lot of my time not reading the books on the syllabus, but reading thrillers and so on from the, um, not from the Bodleian, but from the public library where it used to be uh, under the city hall. And you got a bad third. It was the year they stopped giving fourth class degrees or I would have got a fourth. <laughs> it's a very distinguished degree, also gained by John Betjeman, Evelyn Waugh and W.H. Auden. Nothing to, be, nothing to be ashamed of in having a third. <laughs> And then, then into teaching, Mill and Ford. I meet people who say, you taught them at Mill and Ford. Well, they, they, must be, they must be drunk because I didn't teach at Mill and Ford. I taught at um, Bishop Kirk School. The middle school. Middle school. <laughs> yes. That's right. Um, and various, uh, this is when we, we had middle schools, a three-tier system in Oxford State Education. And um, I had a dozen happy years as a teacher. But then I found I was, um, I was losing my temper more and more, which is a terrible thing to do. I was getting impatient, um, and changes were coming in as well. Politicians were making speeches, saying we all ought to have a national curriculum, and so on and so forth. I didn't, didn't like it. I was glad to get out. Do you regret that? Do you regret going into a li life of writing? No, not at all. I was always writing. It's just a question of whether you can earn a living at it. And of course, you can't at first. So you have to have another job. I did enjoy the teaching. I enjoyed the company of children. I enjoyed the chance to tell them stories. Uh, not my stories necessarily, but stories from the Greek mythology and uh, fairy tales and ghost stories. I loved having an audience. Um, the, trouble with, the trouble with regarding teaching as a performance and your pupils as an audience is you get the same audience day after day after day. You have to make up new jokes. Well, there's no script, you see. You're the script writer and the director. And um, it's, um, well, it, it's, sometimes it's hard. But if you've got enough stories to tell, and the world is full of wonderful stories, um, they'll always listen. And I learned a lot from it as a storyteller. How do you write? Um, how do I write? Well, at the moment, with a bit of difficulty, because I've got rheumatism in my hands and I can't hold a pen anymore. And so I have to type, do it on the computer keyboard, which isn't very, um, which is too fast. I type much faster than I write. And the problem is that um, it's so easy to go back and correct on the computer. I spend a lot of my time crossing out and going back and correcting and changing. And it's not very satisfactory. As soon as this rheumatism um, gives up and goes away, I'll get, pick up my pen again. But no, how do I write? I, I write... Um, by walking about with my eyes and my mouth open for quite a long time, thinking, sitting in cafes, making notes, reading, looking at things, listening to things, uh, while a story f begins to form in my mind. Not the whole of it, but just the hint of a character, the hint of a spine of a series of events, one leading to another, um, and the sense that somewhere at the end of them there's a resolution, there's an ending. Um, that's about all, and then I start writing. Um, by hand, usually, three pages a day, or thereabouts, about a thousand words, and I carry on until I get to the end, and then I stop. 
and then I put it on the computer and start editing. That's, that's how I do it. Uh, uh, Mark, who's a Philip Pullman expert, would like to ask a question or two. I'm not as expert as him. No, nobody can be as expert <laughs> as Philip. Um, yes, I, I, uh, shall I take, yeah, yeah okay. Um, yes, I, I have got some questions about content, but I wanted to just first go back to uh, your time as a student, 1960s. Mm -hmm. you, I'm interested that you said you didn't really uh, register Jericho at that time. Is that because you were perhaps warned away? Uh, or uh, was, you know, was it a town and a gown thing also? I'm interested to know if that even was a, was a thing at that mm. period of time. Uh, there were parts of Jericho, the ages of Jericho I was aware of, Little Clarendon Street which around 1966 became very fashionable. Um, a lot of clothes shops were. This was the time of when Carnaby Street, of course, was ruling the world in terms of fashion. And um, for a while, Little Clarendon Street seemed to be a little Carnaby Street. Um, there was also Wellington Square, where um, some friends of mine had digs. And it was there that I first heard um, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band which I regard as the first step in the decline of the Beatles. They came to a great climax, a great summit of their art in revolver, rubber sole and revolver, and then began to decline. And I was there at the beginning of their decline <laughs> in Wellington Square. This is an unknown side to you, Sir Philip. Yeah, well, yes, exactly. The musicologist. Um, uh, well, th th there, was, there was quite a lot of music going on in Oxford. I remember the Incredible String Band. Anybody remember the Incredible String Band? coming to the, uh, the town hall and doing a concert. Um, so there was all that going on. Um, and, and Lyra is, is a bit conflicted on occasions, whether she's town or gown, it mm. seems to me. You know, you, you do very early on in Northern Lights draw that, uh, that comparison about um, these uh, varying uh, elements of conflict. Um, mm. And that was something quite deliberate, I, I guess. You couldn't kind of do that in, an, in many other cities. I think that's probably true, yes. The town and gown, um, well, the fact that it's known as town and gown suggests it goes back a long way. But in Lyra, it's not so much a conflict as a, a blending. She belongs to both. Temperamentally and um, emotionally, she belongs with her friends um, who are part of the town and also the servants in the college, um, where she's much more at home in the kitchen, for example, and in this, with the servants than she is at high table and with the... Uh, with the scholars, um, but she, the part of her does belong to both, and um, it's a con well, you know, it isn't a conflict, it's a blend that sometimes has to be managed, and I suppose the story of um, the la a later stage in her life, which I'm writing now, it shows that blending still working out. I carry on. John, yeah, one more, one more, Mark. John and I have not um, collaborated on how we, what questions we can ask. So, um, Good I, cop and bad cop, but which um, is which? I'm the bad one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the bad one. Um, yeah, and I, I, I wanted to, I've got a couple of questions which I will blend in with my own local interests. And um, one of them relates to the shirt I'm wearing. Um, Lee Scoresby. Now, um, hot air balloons, interestingly, even though we have had them as a thing for Ooh, let me do a calculation, 239 years, they hardly ever appear in fiction. And so I was delighted that Lee Scoresby, the aeronaut, uh, is there. Um, can you tell us about the inspiration for that? And you know, have you mm. actually flown yourself? Uh, no, I never have flown myself, and I don't think I ever would. Um, I've got far too high a regard for gravity to challenge it in this presumptuous way. Um, you said hot air balloon. Um, on your fine shirt, I don't think they are hot air balloons. I think they're gas balloons. Um, and Lee Scoresby's balloon, uh, he doesn't have a, 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 a sort of furnace thing or a directed flame in it. It's full of, it's full of hydrogen. So you wouldn't want to have a, a lit flame near any of that. Um, the balloons uh, that first took off were the Montgolfier brothers, and that, they think they were hot air balloons, but the discovery of um, lighter than air gases, hydrogen and then later on helium, um, took place rather later than they did. Uh, there was a famous ascent, wasn't there, from um, Port Meadow quite early on? Botanic Gardens. Oh, Botanic Gardens, yes, of course, yeah. Um, well, they were interesting things and fashionable things, and of course, very um, lovely things to look at. And uh, 
the, every so often, we lived, at, we lived near Cutslow Park when I was writing this, and there was a sort of balloon festival, and all sorts of wonderful balloons took off on a summer's day and um, floated through the sky. And there were, there were hot dog stalls and hamburger stalls and all sorts of other things going on and merry-go-rounds. It was a wonderful occasion. Just the sort of thing that Lyra would have loved. Um, but uh, I've never been up in a balloon and I, I, I never really want to. I just like the character of Lee Scoresby. He was a sort of, tra you know, a gunslinger, a, um, um, a gambler, straight out of a Western film. Uh, I, I thought he was very well portrayed both in the TV version that came on recently by Lin-Manuel Miranda and by Sam Elliott who played him in the Golden Compass film. Um, I've had a great, uh, I, I've got a great affection for Lee Scoresby. Uh, uh, Sir Philip, on screen, you weren't very happy with the Hollywood version, were you? What, what about the BBC versions? How have you felt about the way your work has been interpreted on screens? It's it's been a film, it's been a TV adaptation, it's been a stage play, it's been a radio play, drama, it's been an audio book. Um, it's soon, if, if things work out, it's going to be a ballet. So it's, uh, it's, it's had all sorts of incarnations. Um, I'm pretty sanguine about all of them because there is no law that says if your book is made into a film, the book has to be taken away and burnt. The book is still there, uh, and people who go and see the film because they like the book will react in a, in a way which they themselves can predict. We're not always pleased with the adaptation of a book we like. Uh, we think, oh, she wouldn't have looked like that, and he wouldn't have said that, and oh, they changed the ending, and they'd left my favorite bit out, and so on. So our expectation, I think, when we go and see a film of a book uh, we've liked is of disappointment. And usually, we're not disappointed in that expectation. But the, the, the TV version is different because it's longer. In the long-form TV adaptations they've got these days, you can spe you've got the time to tell a full story. Uh, storytelling is a matter of time, not of space. And no matter how big and splendid the screen is and how astonishing the CGI and the special effects are, it doesn't matter to the, to the viewer if the story isn't being told properly. Um, the what happened with the film is that the studio, I think, never really understood what it was they got. They thought it was a sort of family adventure with talking animals. When they discovered there were various theological themes in it, none of which the um, southern states of America would particularly enjoy, I think they got cold feet slightly. But television is more adventurous than the a TV adaptation that I'm very happy with so far. Um, let's, let's talk about God and where we are. You've got an interesting relationship with God, haven't you? Well, I wouldn't presume to think that he was any more interested in me than I am in him. Uh, I was, uh, and I am actually interested in God. I had a religious childhood. My grandfather was a, um, a clergyman, and I spent much of my Childhood Sundays in his church, listening to, the, um, listening to his sermons. He was a wonderful storyteller. And enjoying the words of the hymns and the tunes of the hymns, and especially the words of the Book of Common Prayer, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, uh, much of which I can still recite by heart. That formed me and my, view, my relationship with language more than any other single thing, I think. Um, it, also, it also showed me what reverence meant and it gave me an idea of the importance of ritual and um, a sense that there, were, there was more to things than we learned about in physics lessons or on the news um, or when reading thrillers, indeed. Uh, so, I was always fascinated by religion and its effect that it had on, on the people who believed in it. Um, later on, I came to read all sorts of other um, books, very interesting books. Um, most of all, perhaps, William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience, 
And I was fascinated by that book because it's not about doctrine. It doesn't say this is what Christians believe and that's what you mustn't believe and, and so on. It was about the experiences of people who had been converted to a belief in a faith. And it was these human experiences that William James writes about so well and that I find and still find so interesting. So um, I've never ceased to be interested in religion and the forms it takes. I, was, I wrote The Good Man Jesus and The Scoundrel Christ um, because I wanted to revisit uh, the words of the New Testament, the words I used to know quite well. I wanted to read, as it were, afresh um, the stories that have been so familiar to me about the life and work of Jesus. And I discovered a number of things I simply hadn't noticed before. I discovered, as an adult, the differences between the, um, the Gospels. Now, St. John's is markedly different from the other three. And I asked myself some questions which I hadn't asked then. For example, Jesus was reported to have spent 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. Now, who reported this? Most of his other... Um, parts of his life, his, his miracles, the words he said, are convincingly portrayed because there was somebody there. There was somebody there to write down his words or to remember what he did and to report them later. But who else was with him in the wilderness to write down the dialogue he had with Satan, for example? No one as far as I know. So what are we invited to believe? That he went back to his disciples, his friends, and told them what had happened. I can't see that happening somehow. And there's another occasion when um, Jesus is alone, and yet what, what he did and said are of supreme importance, and that's the betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know the disciples were there, but they were some way off. We also know that they'd fallen asleep. So who was it who heard Jesus say the words that we're told he said? I don't know, um, but I I'm, I'm continue to be interesting. And one thing I did notice is, as a storyteller, that the, um, the fact that the Gospels vary in their account of the resurrection is not um, something that undermines belief in it, but it sort of fortifies it, because it's exactly what happens in a trial. First witness says this, the second witness says something similar, but slightly different in the details, and so on. It's convincing. Um, it's also a wonderful feat of storytelling, because... It doesn't tell us, it doesn't tell us that anybody seeing him get out of the tomb. The idea of a description of Jesus actually rising from the dead and suddenly walking about would be, it would be pathetic, it would be bathos, it would be, even be comic. But the idea of his, his having happened when nobody was there to see it is a brilliant piece of storytelling. So all those things uh, I learned as an adult and I wanted to... Um, I wanted to write about them. Where does religion feature in your work? Where does it, uh, somebody re read in your work? What, what religious meaning is there in there, if any? Well, I'm very wary of telling people what my books mean. Um, it's part of, part of the politics of, of reading and writing. Writing is, is a despotic affair. When you write, you have complete command of everything. The life and death of this character, the punctuation, where you end this chapter and begin another, how you end the story, they're all in your hands and nobody else's. Writing is not a matter for focus groups or discussions or agreements among colleagues. No, it isn't. It's a despotic, totalitarian affair. But the moment the book is published, the moment the book is out there in the market in the world, Readers have the choice to read it or not, and I'm not going to tell them what it means. The meaning of a book is not imposed or should not be imposed by the writer. It should be discovered by the reader in dialogue with the book and in discussion with others if they want to. That's, that's when the process changes from being despotic to being democratic. Writing is tyrannical, reading is democratic. So I don't like to tell people what my book means. How many have you sold? How many have you sold? <laughs> How many books? Yes, I, I'm just thinking. Um, I, I don't know, approaching 20 million, I think. 
Uh, all through David Ficklin? Well, no, that's counting foreign editions as well. Right. But, well, but uh, David Ficklin be your lifetime publisher? Uh, well, he's, he's, published, um, he's published most of my books, yes. We, we first came together when he was a, an editor at Oxford University Press. Um, and he published a book of mine called The Ruby and the Smoke. That would have been in early 80s. And um, since then, I've um, been very happily, very happy to give him every book of mine that, uh, that he wants to publish. Uh, put your hand up if you want to ask a question. Remember, short, sharp questions, please. Can, can I just ask? Go on. Um, yeah, while, while people are just preparing, I have a couple of frivolous questions, Go ahead. Uh, if you don't mind. Um, but as we're talking about publishing, uh, I've just done a walk with a few people uh, across Oxford, and we've mm. arrived here, and we walked past the Fell Press. All <laughs> part of this book. Um, but um, I just wondered what you thought, how you thought uh, Alice, uh, you know, bearing in mind Alice in Wonderland was printed the first edition was printed at the Fell Press, mm -hmm. the University Press. How would Lara and Alice have got on? Well, I'd like to think they'd become friends. Um, different backgrounds, of course, but Alice has a similar, um, uh, well, fearlessness, I suppose, um, and also a blunt, um, no-nonsense approach to all the nonsense. And uh, I, I think that's something, there's something lyratic about that. Um, Alice is the great originator of pretty well all children's books that came after it. It's, um, it's wonderfully unparental, un -par unparenty. Uh, he established a rule with Alice, well, not a rule, he just pointed out how important it was to take your child protagonist out of the way of parents. Any adults, um, get away, we don't want you. No, this is a children's world. And the adults who Alice meets in Wonderland and later on in Through the Looking Glass are all um, bonkers, uh, as many adults are seen by children anyway. Uh, so uh, they, they, they establish a, a sort of freedom, uh, a, a, a wild exuberance of imagination that I don't think was there in children's books before, though it was patchily present in, written in nursery rhymes. We see that same sort of um, wonderful, exuberant, inventive imagination in, in, in nursery rhymes, um, together with a strong rhythm, which you also get in such things as Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves did Gyre and Gimble in the Wabe. Or Mimsy with the Borogoves and the Momraths outgrabe. Um, in, in the nursery rhymes, you've got the this is the this is the priest all shaven and shorn, who married the man all tattered and torn, who kissed the maid with the comp you know, all that, that wonderful stuff, which nursery rhymes have in such abundance. A, a few elections ago, in fact it was 2015, I live near the constituency of David Cameron. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to put myself up for election in his constituency, standing for the nursery rhyme party? <laughs> um, we'd have a, 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 a very fine defense policy. We'd have 10,000 men, march them up to the top of the hill and march them down again. Um, we would have uh, a sound incomes policy. It shall have about a penny a day because it won't work any faster. And the NHS would never run short of vinegar and brown paper. But um, I didn't go through with it. I didn't go through with it. So I was never elected to Parliament. Not, I think there was very much chance of that. Last question. Right, yes, I've just got one, one more and then we'll hand over. Um, I, I, for, firstly, I just like that adjective, lyratic. Um, especially as we're so close to the Oxford English Dictionary, I think you should write that down and it could be in there eventually. Um, now, my last one, and I think I do know the answer to this because I walked around the Story Museum yesterday, is um, what would your demon be? Well, I think uh, she would be a bird and probably a bird of the family that, of birds that steals things. Um, a magpie, a, a jackdaw. Um, I would be very happy indeed if she were a raven, because I think ravens are very handsome birds, besides being the subject of um, much poetry um, and uh, being tremendously aerobatic. I love watching 
ravens in the Alps, for example, twisting round and round as they dive down low. Uh, I think she'd have a fine time as a raven, and I, I, I would love to watch her. So I think um, if I could choose, but you can't choose. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. You have to put up with whatever your demon turns out to be. And if somebody says, plenty of people would like a lion, and they end up with a poodle. <laughs> that's it. You have to put up with it. Hands up. Anybody wants to ask a question, please? A uh, uh, man in the front. The vicar, the vicar will bring you the microphone. Uh, my name is Geoffrey, and welcome. It's very nice to see you here this evening. Thank you. Um, in a parallel universe, what would you have been if not a teacher and a writer? Thank you. What would I be in a parallel universe? Well, I would like to have been um, a, a rock star. <laughs> but somehow I don't think that's very likely. And maybe they wouldn't have rock and roll in this um, parallel universe. Something to do with music, possibly something to do with wood. I do love working with wood. So anything that was um, creative in a little way, craftsman-like, really, something like that, that's what I'd like to have done. In what kind of band? What band would you like to be in? Um, well, I, it wouldn't be a band that already existed. I'd have to make it up. I, I, never, I used to play the guitar, of course, everybody did, but I, n I never played with anybody else. I was always um, being Bob Dylan or... I'm afraid to say Donovan occasionally. <laughs> Any other questions? Hands up, please. My name is April, and how did you choose Lyra's name? Thank you. I can actually remember exactly how I chose Lyra's name. Uh, when I was singing hymns in my grandfather's church, as I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite hymns was the Easter hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, Hallelujah. And being uh, eager to read everything that came under my eye, I used to look and see who wrote the hymns. And that hymn comes from a collection, as I now realize, called Lyra Davidica, which means the songs or the songs of David. Now he's looking it up to see if I'm right. <laughs> I, saw, I saw the name, Ly I saw it Lyra Davidica, which means the songs of David or the harp of David, I should say. And I thought it was a name. I thought it was somebody's name, a woman called Lyra Davidica. And I thought, well, that's a nice name. And years later, I, um, now we'll wait for the verdict, see if I got it right. Absolutely, Lyra Davidica, 1708. Lyra Davidica, I, 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 so I got it right. That's how her name came from. But I, I realized also it's the name of a constellation in the sky, a lyre, which is a sort of Greek harp. It's a musical instrument, really. My question is, so as I read the first trilogy when I was about seven, and I thought that all three were so magical, and then now I've been reading the second trilogy about Lyra when she's older, and I felt that there's something a lot more dark about Oxford. It has a different, very different feeling than in the original books. And um, I was wondering if that is simply a result of Lyra growing up, or if it's your own perception of Oxford changing over time. <laughs> Ah uh, yes, that's that's very interesting. I'll, um, thank you. The difference in feeling between the first trilogy and the second trilogy, which I'm still working on, and incidentally, which is a page longer now than it was this morning. <laughs> so uh, I am working at it. Um, yes, it is. It's partly because Lyra's growing up. Now I thought when I was writing his Dark Materials, and after I'd finished it. Um, I thought that that was it. Um, the story of Lyra was finished, and there would be no more, and I'd go on to write other things. But the idea came back to me, look, she's only 12 or 11 or something. She's had this big... Is that, is, is that it? Is that all there is? In the words of a Peggy Lee song. Is that, will she have no more adventures as long as she... Well, I couldn't bear that, and I don't think she could either. And the world was changing, and power of various sorts, political power, is leaking away from this part and concentrating in another part. The world, the, the, you know, the world and politics and so on are changing just as they are in our world. And she's growing up and she's becoming discontented, as everybody does in their teenage years. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to write about that. 
So that's the, the, the journey I set her out on. But before that, of course, there was the La Belle Sauvage, which tells the story of how, as a baby, uh, she came to Oxford in the first place. Um, Lyra is present all the way through La Belle Sauvage, but she has no agency. She can't do anything. She's, what, six months old or something. So the activity takes place around her. And we begin to see people who are going to be very important later on in her life, like um, Malcolm uh, Polstead from the Trout and Alice, um, his friend, and various other people. Um, I found that very interesting. And as she travels, as she has to do in that book, as she travels east and further east and further east again, um, various things happen. She learns various things. She encounters all kinds of dangers and adventures. And it's all, um, it's, it's all very exciting for me because I don't know what's going to happen. I have to write in order to find out. Um, hi, my name is Ali and I was wondering, um, how did you come up with the idea of demons? How did I come to the idea of demons? Well, that happened, um, thank you very much. Demons, yes. I didn't have it when I first started writing the story, and I've, I've, I've told this about this many times, so forgive me if you've heard it before. I'd started writing the book with Lyra on her own um, in Jordan College, going into the room where she shouldn't be and overhearing something that was not meant for her to hear. Um, and it wasn't going very well. I was finding it very difficult to move past this first incident. And suddenly one day, I found myself writing the words Lyra and her demon. And quite honestly, I promise you, I had no idea until that moment that she had a demon or what a demon was. But it was useful to have him there because, as I discovered when I wrote the rest of the sentence and then the rest of the paragraph and then the rest of the chapter, it was very good for her to have someone to talk to. And they could talk and they could argue and they could, she could say, let's go in there. And he could say, no, don't, we're not supposed to. And so there was a sort of, there was much more going on. It's always easier to tell a story when it's not just one person. When it's just one person, you have to tell the reader what they're doing, but not what they say, because there's no one to talk to. So you have to tell them what they think. But that's very slow, and it slows up the story no end. Much better when you have two or three people there, and they can, they can egg each other on, they can encourage each other, they can warn, they can argue. Um, and so having discovered that um, Lyra had a demon and she, she had someone to talk to, the rest of the book was, um, well, I won't say it was very easy after that, but the, the main difficulty had got, got been, been dealt with. And I discovered that everybody had a demon in her world. And the big thing, the really thing that really got the story going was realizing that children's demons could change shape, but grown-ups' demons couldn't. They were stuck. So if your demon turned out to be a poodle when you when you're in in your teenage years and adolescence, and you learn what you're doing, you learn something about your nature. You learn something about the kind of person you are. I mean, what you have to be or do if your demon is a poodle is to be the best sort of poodle you can possibly be. Um, it shows you what you're good at, you see. And a lot of people get quite well advanced in life before they realize what it is that they're good at, or even what they like. You can tell yourself that you like, for example, um, uh, you like jazz very much because you were listening to it when you were a boy and, or a girl and other people, your friends were listening to it, and you think you love jazz and you can continue listening to it, but then you realize you don't actually like it very much. You prefer classical music or whatever it might be. So we don't always know what we like and we have to sort of struggle and think and fight and listen to ourselves and listen to the world and look at the world before we discover what we're good at and what we even like. So it's a matter of growing up. And your demon in, in Lyra's world helps you with that. And that's one of the reasons why I found them so useful. Do you plot? Do I plot? Yes. No, yes and no, a little bit. But no, I don't, I don't work it out in advance. You don't have a, 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 a map, a master map? No, 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 no. So Philip, uh, I wanted to ask you something about your role as uh, the executive uh, producer of these dark materials on uh, BBC, because I suppose that gives you uh, less right to complain about it. And I wondered whether, in that role, how much uh, 
of a role you did play in uh, translating uh, the book onto the screen without uh, actually taking account of the fact you actually wrote it. But did you have to undertake many battles with the BBC, kind of like an Arnold Bear might? Nobody quite knows what an executive producer exactly. is. Exactly. Yes. Thank you very much. Nobody quite knows what an executive producer is. I didn't know. Um, what, uh, what, what I, the, I, I played a different role in all the different adaptations that I've done. Um, it was interesting to watch the film being made because I'd never seen a film being made at such close quarters. Interesting in parts and for short periods of time. It's also very boring to watch a film being made. Um, and I didn't have much effect on that because it cost so much money to make that the last thing they wanted was some damn fool of a writer interfering. Uh, on the stage, when it was done at the National Theatre, um, I was invited to, to be quite, to have quite a close part in it. Um, I discussed the story in full with the, with the writer and with um, Nicholas Heitner, who directed it. I visited rehearsals. I was able to change a couple of things that I thought could be slightly improved here and there. Uh, I, felt, I felt involved and um, appreciated throughout. Um, what else has it been? Radio play, I didn't have much to do with that. Um, the ballet? I don't anticipate having much to do with the ballet. I can't say, no, do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> uh, no, um, but the television um, production, which is partly BBC, partly HBO, partly um, a company called Bad Wolf. They were very helpful all the way through, or I was as helpful as I could be to them. I saw the script, I made comments um, about this or that, which they took notice of. Um, I, we looked at all the, the designs, and I generally what you have to do with designers is hold them back. They all want to cover everything with twiddles, and designs, and arches, and cupolas, and domes, and um, fancy stuff. And I kept saying, no, let's just make it simple, make it plain, make it simple. And I think they listened to me to some extent. Um, I didn't spend much time on set because I'm not, it's too late for me then. Um, they got precise, a precise camera script, and if I interfered with that, it would interfere with their schedule and everything else. And so it's too late for you to do anything then. Um, but um, very, relations were very cordial throughout. Is it a new series, Sir Philip? There is the third series, yes, which when, is... When is that? Well, um, probably at the end of this year. I'm not sure. But it's filmed and it will be... Um, it's in the course of editing and so forth at the moment. The link between setting and story is very, very powerful and that could be true of your work. Um, I just wanted to know what you think the impact would have been had you not have spent such a time in Oxford on his dark materials and later work. Um, I, I could write about Oxford because I know it, because it's my home city and I can wander about and look at things. It would be very difficult um, to write about a city I'd never been to. Um, I could write about Norwich a bit because I grew up there, and London a bit because I've lived there too. But Oxford had, Oxford's got everything really. It's about the right size. It's close enough to London to get there in an hour or so. It's got a river. It's got one of the best bookshops in the world. It's got um, lots of beautiful places like this where people can hold meetings or listen to music. It's, um, it's a wonderful place to live. Uh, and it's the character of Oxford, really, that does come out, I think, in my writing. And if I had written about um, Stoke-on-Trent, for example, it would be a different sort of book. Not least because I don't know Stoke-on-Trent. But I've got no compunction about writing about places I don't know. I mean, I've never been to the North Pole, never been to the Arctic, but I have been to the Bodleian Library, which contains all sorts of information about all sorts of things. Um, so, uh, but you're right, Oxford does play a big part, and the book wouldn't be the same if I didn't know it. Okay. Thank you. Right, I think probably most people had a chance to ask questions. Now, you thought you were here to to hear Sir Philip, also here to, to, to buy this book in which <laughs> there, there is a, a Pullman walk. It's, it's £10 which you give to me and more on sale at the back. And we're also going to uh, give Sir Philip one of these wonderful Jericho mugs, an Emma Bridgewater mug. 
uh, they're on sale at the back as well. Uh, meanwhile, um, uh, we'd like to thank Mr. Philip very, very much indeed. He's, uh, all of our dreams have been realised. Would you put your hands together and thank him very much indeed. <laughs>